Good morning and welcome. Happy Easter. Trust the Lord will bless and make uh, his life ours in this day. Let me just remind you of some of the announcements. There's not going to be a hospitality meal today, but Lord willing, we'll resume that next week. Uh, remember that Zach Parker is also preaching this evening. I hope you'll be able to come. Uh, this Wednesday, the elders will be meeting for their monthly meeting, so pray that God will bless that. And this Friday is the fundraiser for Geneva Academy, the spring fundraiser. Everyone is invited to that Friday evening from 6 to 8. Notice that the deadline for our books for this month is this Tuesday. So make sure that you've gotten that. And also notice that Al Benson's um, kind of giving out some of his books and there are some available for you on the shelf uh, over here, you can look at it and take it, take any ones that you like. That would be fine. Are there any other announcements before we begin our worship this morning? Okay, very good. Let's prepare to worship God. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, let us worship God.
grace to you and peace in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. The Lord be with you. Christ is risen. He is risen indeed. O death, where is your sting? O Hades, where is your victory? Thanks be to God who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Let us humbly kneel and confess our sins to Almighty God. Almighty God, who has brought again from the dead our Lord Jesus Christ, we confess that we are unworthy of your redeeming grace. We have not believed your promises, nor heeded your word, and have neglected the things that belong to our peace. But now in penitence we come to you, beseeching your forgiveness. Mercifully grant us cleansing from all our sins, and restore unto us the joy of your salvation for the sake of Jesus Christ, our only mediator and redeemer. Amen. Arise and hear the good news of God's forgiveness. Almighty God in his mercy has given his son to die for you and for his sake forgives you all your sins in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. give thanks unto the Lord our God. It is truly meet, right, and salutary that we should at all times and in all places give thanks unto Thee, O Lord, Holy Father, Almighty, everlasting God. Therefore, with angels and archangels, and with all the company of heaven, we laud and magnify thy glorious name, evermore praising thee and singing. God, who for our redemption gave your only begotten Son to the death of the cross, and by his glorious resurrection delivered us from the power of our enemy, grant us so to die daily to sin, that we may evermore live with him in the joy of his resurrection through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forevermore. Amen.
Our lesson this morning is from Isaiah chapter 65, beginning at verse 17. So hear the word of the living God. For behold, I create a new heavens and a new earth, and the former shall not be remembered to come to mind. But be glad and rejoice forever in what I create. For behold, I create Jerusalem as a rejoicing and her people a joy. I will rejoice in Jerusalem and joy in my people. The voice of weeping shall no longer be heard in her, nor the voice of crying. No more shall an infant from there live but a few days, nor an old man who has not fulfilled his days. For the child shall die 100 years old, but the sinner being 100 years old shall be accursed. They shall build houses and in inhabit them, and they shall plant vineyards and eat their fruit. They shall not build and another inhabit, they shall not plant and another eat. For as the days of a tree, so are the days of my people, and my elect shall long enjoy the work of their hands. They shall not labor in vain, but bring forth children for trouble. For they shall be the descendants of the blessed of Yahweh, and their offspring with them. And it shall come to pass that before they call, I will answer. And while they are still speaking, I will hear. The wolf and the lamb shall feed together. The lion shall eat straw like the ox, and dust shall be the serpent's food. They shall not hurt nor destroy in all my holy mountain, says Yahweh. And that is the word of the Lord. Preserve me, O oh God, for in you I take refuge. I say to Yahweh, you are my Lord. I have no good apart from you. As for the saints in the land, they are the excellent ones in whom is all my delight. The sorrows of those who run Epistle reading is from 1 Corinthians chapter 15, beginning at verse 12. Hear the word of the living God. Now, if Christ is preached that he has been raised from the dead, how do some among you say that there is no resurrection of the dead? But if there is no resurrection of the dead, then Christ is not risen. And if Christ is not risen, then our preaching is in vain and your faith is also vain. Yes, and we are found false witnesses of God because we have testified of God that he raised up Christ whom he did not raise up if in fact the dead do not rise. 
For if the dead do not rise, then Christ is not risen. And if Christ is not risen, your faith is futile. You are still in your sins. Then also those who have fallen asleep in Christ have perished. If in this life only we have hope in Christ, we are of all men the most pitiable. But now Christ is risen from the dead and has become the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. For since by man came death, by man also came the resurrection of the dead. For as in Adam all die, even so in Christ all shall be made alive. But each in his own order, Christ the first fruits, afterward those who are Christ at his comings. Then comes the end, when he delivers the kingdom of God the Father, when he delivers the kingdom to God the Father, when he puts an end to all rule and all authority and power. For he must reign till he has put all enemies under his feet. The last enemy that will be destroyed is death. And that is the word of the Lord.
Amen. Amen. Now hear the gospel of our Lord from Luke chapter 24, beginning at verse 1. Now on the first day of the week, very early in the morning, they and certain other women with them came to the tomb, bringing the spices which they had prepared. But they found the stone rolled away from the tomb. Then they went in and did not find the body of the Lord Jesus. And it happened as they were greatly perplexed about this, that behold, two men stood by them in shining garments. Then as they were afraid and bowed their faces to the earth, they said to them, why do you seek the living among the dead? He is not here, but is risen. Remember how he spoke to you when he was still in Galilee, saying, the son of man must be delivered into the hands of sinful men and be crucified, and the third day rise again. And they remembered his words. Then they returned from the tomb and told all these things to the eleven and to all the rest. It was Mary Magdalene, Joanna, Mary the mother of James, and the other women with them who told these things to the apostles. And their words seemed to them like idle tales, and they did not believe them. But Peter arose and ran to the tomb, and stooping down, he saw the linen cloths lying by themselves, and he departed, marveling to himself at what had happened. And that is the gospel of our Lord. We do give you praise and thanks, O Lord God of heaven and earth, that you have not left your son in the tomb under the power of death, but have delivered, has del have delivered him from death so that life now reigns. And we praise you for his great victory. Help us now to see that victory, to rejoice in it, and to respond properly to it so that we too can bring glory and praise to your holy name. Hear our prayers. For Jesus' sake, amen. People of God, we're living in a day of new rules in a way, aren't we? we? Everybody, we're told, has the right to believe whatever they please. And, they are, and we're supposed to accept it as legitimate. And of course, that rule only applies though, even though it, they, they use all inclusive terms, that only applies to every group but one. And guess who that is? That'd be us. Um, the Christians who believe the Bible to be God's true and infallible word are the only ones who are not allowed to say what they believe publicly. They're the only ones who are viewed as heretics in the modern world. And they're heretics because they actually believe that the triune God of the Bible is the one who created all things, who knows all things, and who has sent his only begotten son into the world to reveal the way of the way and the truth and the life to all men. So that any man who rejects the son rejects God himself and all who reject God, the God of the Bible, are rejecting life and therefore shall perish. So that message is the message that is most offensive in our day. The only way it turns out you can be an acceptable Christian is to be one who rejects the Bible's teaching and doesn't uphold it or, or say anything about it. You're not allowed to say that there is only one way to know God and to have life. You're not allowed. You have to allow for all other beliefs and call them equally legitimate. In other words, the only way you're allowed to be a Christian is to deny Christ. And that is not something that we can do any more than they could do it in the first century. We need to remember that this was basically the position the world put the church in in the first century of its existence. It was, it was a world that was dominated by pluralism. Men believed in many gods and in many religions and there were, and there were many beliefs that were, that were upheld and proclaimed. And they were, again, the Christians were demanded, once again, not to disagree, but remember their response. They refused to play along. They refused to acknowledge that men had the right to reject Christ and feel like they were okay. They refused 
to deny Jesus as Lord. And they did so because they understood to go along with the world in its demand would have been to deny reality. It would have been to deny history and undeniable facts. Christianity, in contrast to all other religions, is founded upon things that actually happened in time and on earth. The incarnation of the Son of God, Jesus Christ, his baptism by John, his teaching and ministry throughout Israel, his betrayal and arrest and trial before the Sanhedrin and Pilate, his death on the cross, his burial in the tomb, and finally his physical bodily resurrection on the third day, followed by his ascension and uh, from earth to heaven 40 days later. Each of those things happened on a particular day at a particular time, in a particular month, in a particular year. They are historic facts that actually occurred. And all these things are central to what we believe. It is grounded in history. And that which makes the incarnation and the life and teaching and work of Jesus and his death on the cross significant is in fact the resurrection of Jesus on the third day. And not, and of course, then his ascension and seating at the right hand of the Father. Jesus was not merely a great man or a great example or a teacher or a great leader. He is, in fact, the one who is the eternal ever-living king to whom all men must ultimately give account. He is the Lord of all. And that's the thing that Paul is emphasizing in 1 Corinthians 15. He's concerned because there are people in the church in Corinth who have denied the resurrection. And he's speaking, obviously, they haven't denied uh, some idea of resurrection. That was something that, was, that many in the ancient world believed. What they did deny was a bodily resurrection, a real resurrection from the dead, so that Jesus, the man, was resurrected. It's not just an idea. It's not just a, a, a nice thought that holds a great deal of symbolism for us and hope for us. Rather, Paul says, it is essential. And we have to understand that without it, there is no faith, no true faith to believe at all. Listen again to how you're familiar with, uh, with chapter 15, but the first opening verses of that are very important. We didn't read them this morning, so let me read them now and listen to them. Moreover, brethren, he says, I declare to you the gospel which I preach to you, which also you received and in which you stand, by which also you are saved if you hold fast that word which I preach to you, unless you believed in vain. For I deliver to you, first of all, that which I also received, that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures and that he was buried and that he rose again the third day according to the scriptures and that he was seen by Cephas then by the twelve and after that he was seen by over 500 brethren at once of whom the greater part remain to the present but some have fallen asleep and after that he was seen by James and then by all the apostles and then last of all he was seen by me also as one born out of due time. Paul is concerned, you see here, to lay down the, and to make it clear to the Corinthians that what he has proclaimed to them, the gospel that has been delivered to them, is not a set of philosophical ideas or abstract theories or moral ideals. It's, a, it's not a system of ethical maxims or theoretical theology. It's not a new philosophy or a strategy for living. It's not some new technique to get by. It is a declaration of historic realities centered around the second person of the Godhead who was actually born, who actually lived among men, who died and rose again from the grave. Christianity, a Christianity that is not tied down to these historic realities is not anything that can be believed. If these things did not occur, 
there really is no gospel to proclaim at all. And so Paul goes on, carries forward this thought at the beginning of our passage this morning, which begins at verse 12. Now he says, if Christ is preached, that he has been raised from the dead, how do some among you say that there is no resurrection from the dead? But if there is no resurrection of the dead, then Christ is not risen. And if Christ is not risen, then our preaching is empty and your faith is also empty. Yes, and we are found false witnesses of God because we have testified of God that he raised up Christ whom he did not raise up if in fact the dead do not rise. For if the dead do not rise, then Christ is not risen. And if Christ is not risen, your faith is futile. You are still in your sins. Then those who have fallen asleep in Christ have perished. For if in this life only we have hope in Christ, we are of all men the most pitiable. Now that's, a, that's such a strong statement. Some, he says, in Corinth were saying that there was no bodily, physical resurrection. They were like many moderns who say the resurrection spoken of is really a symbolic idea. It's not literal. It's another way of saying we have a, a fresh start or a second chance or a new beginning. It's like spring. We come alive again. We can turn over a new leaf and start all over. And Paul says, you know, no matter how true some of those things may be, if Christ is not raised, then there is no hope. And what I have proclaimed and what you have believed is vain. That is, it's worthless. It is simply nothing that can be trusted and that is ultimately any good. It's worthless and stupid for us to believe it if there is no physical bodily resurrection from the grave. For if there is no resurrection in that way, Jesus is not raised, and if he is not raised, then there's no point. There is no point in believing anything that I've said because if Jesus is not raised, you are still in your sins. The world has not changed. You are still hopeless. There is nothing to, to hope in. If Jesus' body is decaying in the tomb, then there's nothing really to believe in because you are condemned. The world is the same as it always has been. Christianity hinges on the fact that God has defeated sin and death through the work of Jesus dying on the cross. And that's where the resurrection is important. It confirms the fact that Jesus' death did in fact pay the full penalty for our sins. And it confirms the fact that the power of death, the condemnation of sin, has been broken and defeated. Death has been put to death. But if Jesus has not been raised then the condemnation of sin has not been met. The penalty of sin has not been paid, obviously, since he's still in the grave. If he's not raised, then the power of death has not been broken. Sin has not been paid for. And we are, Paul says, among the most foolish people in the world to have believed such a lie. Our faith is as empty as the world's. But this contradicts the reality and so Paul says in verse 12, but now, or, or, I'm sorry, or verse, verse uh, 20, but now, he says, Christ is risen from the dead and has become the first fruits of those who sleep. What some are saying in Corinth contradicts the reality that can be confirmed by more than 500 witnesses. Now Jesus is surely risen from the dead, the tomb is still empty, Paul says. And because of this historical fact, all that God has intended from the beginning, all of his purposes that were proclaimed by the prophets, all of those things will be certainly, surely realized. And it has been secured for us by Jesus' death and his resurrection from the dead. Now to get a feel for what Paul is saying we need to remember the, the mindset of the Jews. Remember how they understood the story that God had revealed 
in the scriptures, they understood that Adam was created to rule over the earth, filling it, subduing it, taking dominion over it. And since Adam failed in that calling, God had chosen Abraham and his descendants to be the ones who would do what Adam had failed to do. They would be fruitful and multiply, and they would rule over the earth. The promise to Abraham was that God would make him a great nation. He's going to bless Abraham and make uh, make his name great, and Abraham and his de- through his descendants are going to be a blessing to all the earth. He God is going to bless those who bless him, and he will curse those who curses who curse him, and all the families of the earth eventually through Abraham's family will be blessed. And that promise was repeated to Isaac and to Jacob, and it became the foundation of the self identity of the Jews. They understood that they were the people who had inherited who had inherited the calling of Adam and Eve. They were the true faithful people. They were the true humanity. And their destiny was to reign on the earth in the new Garden of Eden. God would, God's original purpose would be fulfilled through them. Israel's destiny then was to rule over the nations just as Adam was to take dominion over the beasts of the field in the beginning. And this would all be fulfilled and brought to pass through the, through the Messiah, the one that Daniel and Ezekiel and the other prophets had identified as the Son of Man. Through him, the kingdom of God would be established. It would fill the earth and all the enemies of Israel, all the enemies of God would be defeated. He would overthrow the, the rebellious kings and rulers of the nations that, who had oppressed Israel and opposed Israel's God. And he would raise up the righteous and make God's people the rulers of the world. This was what they understood by salvation. And we have to remember that when you read the Bible and you see the word salvation, you and I think, because we've been reared up in a, in a, a, a totally different uh, historical context, we think going to heaven when you die. And of course, that's not untrue. It's just not the way Israel and, and uh, the Jews thought about salvation. They thought in a very worldly sense, it was, and, and I mean in, the, in, a, in a this world sense, that God was actually going to work in history and that he would correct everything that Adam's sin turned upside down. That would, all that would be turned right side up through Messiah and by their faithful rule so that the world would be restored to its original purpose and, in, and the purposes of God would be fulfilled. That was what they understood by salvation. They, they of course, believed in eternal life. They all thought that there would be a resurrection. All of God's people would be resurrected at the last day, like Ezekiel had prophesied. They read Ezekiel 37 in this sense. The faithful in Israel would be resurrected and glorified and they would rule the new world order. This would be the inauguration of the new heavens and the new earth. It was in, and even though the, the Jews didn't, weren't all unanimous in the way they thought this was going to happen and in the details of what they believed was going to happen, but they believed in the fact that it would happen. However it worked itself out, this is the way things would end up. And Paul now is correcting their understanding of the future. What the Jews had thought the Messiah would do is in fact the thing that Jesus has done by his death and his resurrection and of course his ascension. He he, he is the second Adam. He is the righteous one. He's the faithful representative of all of God's people. And the fact that he has been raised bodily from the grave is the proof that he has accomplished the work that God had promised would be accomplished through the prophets. He has secured and actually inaugurated the kingdom of God and doing that he has established the new heavens and the new earth already. And securing all that God had promised 
will now for certain come to pass because Jesus lives and reigns and through his death has defeated, has paid the penalty for sin, defeated death, and now will live forever as the great king. What the Jews thought would happen at the end of history has actually happened in Jesus' resurrection in the middle of history. Jesus is the first fruits, Paul says, securing the glorious future for the world. Now Christ, he says, verse 20, is risen from the dead and has become the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. Again here, he's alluding to the festival of first fruits, which was the annual feast that followed the Passover. Jesus dies on Passover, so that that was the great feast of Israel. Then uh, the next day is the Sabbath, so he rests. He rests from his great warfare and victory, just like all the great kings, like God himself did after the six days of creation. God rested and rejoiced in the work of his hands. Jesus rests on the Sabbath in the grave, rejoicing in the work of his hands, the, bringing in the new creation. And then Jesus rises from the grave on the first day, which was the Feast of First Fruits. We know that was Sunday. That was the day of resurrection. Paul points out that's also First Fruits, right? So you understand what Jesus is doing, what God is doing through him. He is the First Fruits. The First Fruits feast was that where you took that first bundle of, of, uh, of wheat that had come up and you offered that to the Lord acknowledging that there would be a full harvest later on. And the Feast of Tabernacles would celebrate that full in gathering. But the first fruits was the pledge of the blessing that all the full harvest would follow. So Paul says, that's what Jesus was, that's what God is doing through his son. He raises his son to secure the resurrection of all his people at the last day. Jesus' Jesus' resurrection confirms the fact that all of God's faithful will be raised from the dead as well. They will share in his victory over sin and death. He is the second Adam. And just as Adam's sin brought death upon all men, so Jesus' righteous faithfulness secures life for all in him. As in Adam all die, Paul says, so in Christ all shall be made alive. But each in his own order. Christ the first fruits, and afterwards those who are Christ at his coming. Then comes the end, Paul goes on to say, when he delivers the kingdom of God the Father and when he puts an end to all rule and authority and power. The bodily resurrection of Jesus secures not only the fact of forgiveness and spiritual resurrection, but the bodily resurrection and glorification of all who are in him at the last day. There will be a literal victory over the grave, over death itself. After all of God's purposes have been accomplished, the earth will be filled in with the knowledge and glory of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. Jesus' resurrection changed the history of the world by securing the eternal purposes of God. Since the king lives, never to die anymore, since he's been given all authority and power and exalted over everything in heaven and on earth, then he will secure all of those things that God has promised. He will continue to reign, Paul says, until all his enemies are put under his feet. He will be victorious over all. And then, Paul says, and that includes the greatest of all enemies. And he wants the Jews to understand that the greatest enemy is not the Romans, nor is it the Samaritans, nor is it the compromising, apostate, half-hearted, lukewarm Jews. Rather, the great enemy is death, death itself. And Paul says death will be destroyed as well. The last enemy that will be destroyed, he said, is death. After God's people have been glorified like their Savior, death itself will be put to death. And so at the end of this chapter, at verse 54, Paul picks this up. And he says that 
going back over what he's just told us, he then goes on to say, then the saying that is written shall have been brought to pass. Death is swallowed up in victory. And of course, you remember that he's referring there to Isaiah 25, that great passage that describes the blessings of the rule of the Messiah King. This is what's going to happen because Messiah is victorious. He's going to have this glorious banquet and there will be a grand celebration on the mountain of the Lord. Listen again to Isaiah 25. And, in, and on this mountain, Yahweh of hosts will make for all people a feast of choice pieces, a feast of wines on the lees, of fat things full of marrow, of well-refined wines on the lees. And he will destroy on this mountain the surface of the covering cast over all people and the veil that is spread over all nations. He will swallow up death forever. And Yahweh God will wipe away tears from all faces. The rebuke of his people he will take away from all the earth. For Yahweh has spoken, and it will be said in that day, Behold, this is our God. We have waited for him, and he will save us. This is Yahweh. We have waited for him, and we will be glad and rejoice in his salvation. Here's the picture of the many blessings that come to the world as a result of the work of Messiah. Isaiah has been describing in that section of his prophecy the coming judgment and the, and the great deliverance that the king, Messiah, is going to bring when he establishes his kingdom on the holy hill and salvation flows to the nations. And you see this, this description that, that Isaiah gives reflects the customs that the world picked up. Remember uh, when a new king or a great victory had been won when a new king comes to the throne, it was customary to celebrate that with a sacrificial meal or a great festal banquet. And that was symbolic of the great blessings that would come to the world with the coming of this new age, the coming of the new king or the coming of the great, uh, the, the, the great victors who now had defeated all their enemies. From the beginning... God signified the blessedness of living in covenant with him by eating, eating food, a lot of food. The Garden of Eden was filled with food. And so it was the epitome of great blessedness and peace to celebrate with a great feast. And that symbol was picked up and imitated by the pagan kings even. They were imitating the great king when they did so, as Isaiah says here. When Messiah has accomplished his work, when he has established his kingdom, it will be a great banquet, and not just of any kind of food, but the best of the best. Fat things full of marrow, well-refined wines on the least. But this great victory accomplished by the Lord will not only be a blessing for Israel, as Isaiah says, and like the Jews had come to think, but the blessings of Messiah's work will include the nations. They will, there will no longer be a division between Jew and Gentile. All the nations will see the light of truth and the truth of God. By his work, Messiah is going to destroy the veil of sorrow and darkness. And he's going to do that by swallowing up death. He will swallow up death forever, wipe away all tears from all faces, that is, give comfort to those who have been kept in fear of death all their lives. He will, and he's going to take away the rebuke of his people and remove the veil. And the prophet uses, when he talks about death here, he uses the article before it. He will take away the death. The great enemy will be swallowed up. Up to this point, death has been swallowing up the whole world. Death has been the one, the great eater, destroying all men without any opposition, with no hope that you could defeat him. But when the Lord, through his Messiah, accomplishes his great work of redemption, death itself will be swallowed up. Jesus eats death and puts it to death, sends it to hell, so that only those who reject him will be swallowed up by it ever again. It will be swallowed up forever. Death will never again be victorious. It has been swallowed up in victory. And the consequence of that is, as Isaiah says, God wipes away 
all tears and the reproach of his people is removed. Everything that brought sorrow and shame will be taken away. Sin has been paid for. And the veil that covers the eyes and blinded the eyes of the world will be destroyed. It too will be taken away so that all men can see when they had not been a- what they had not been able to see previously. And they shall see the glory of the Lord and therefore repent and believe. They will rejoice in his victory over sin and death and hell. So Paul says, this is what's happened. This is what has been secured by the death and resurrection of Jesus. The world's history has been permanently changed. And that's why the church has observed this day. From the day of resurrection to this day, we observe the resurrection in a special way because the world was transformed on that day. Without the resurrection, the incarnation of Jesus would have made little difference to the world. But the resurrection has changed everything. And that's why Paul says, don't miss the significance of this. Be sure that you respond to the resurrection as you should. Don't just sit and acknowledge it. Don't ever think of it as just some kind of symbolic, nice psychological thing to uh, idea that, you, that, that will give you uh, some kind of hope in a day of sorrow. Remember uh, its reality. And Paul closes out chapter 15 of 1 Corinthians by pointing to how we should respond, how we must respond in light of this glorious reality. Two things need to be done, he says. You must be immovable in your steadfastness. Never doubt the things that have been revealed to us. Hold fast to everything that God has taught. Never neglect them. Never forget them. Remember these things. Continue to oppose the lies of the devil. Don't be moved by the threat of suffering or the present persecution or tribulation that comes upon you. Don't allow yourself to be seduced by the allurements of the world and the desire for fame or, or prestige or power or glory or approval or respect. Don't be afraid of what they're going to do. Stand, take a stand and be immovable. Stand even when everyone around you apostatizes. Stand and do not waver and never give an inch to the world, the flesh, or the devil. The resurrection confirms the truth that you will not lose by standing with the king. And then Paul goes on, he says, so be immovable. Don't let anybody push you around on these things. But he says, here's the second thing. Continue to abound in the work of the Lord. Make it your focus to excel in everything that God puts to your hands to do. Bring glory to Christ, serve him, love him, obey him, worship him, call others to follow him, hunger and thirst for righteousness so that you can be like him, so that whether you eat or whether you drink or whatever you do, you're doing it all to the glory of God. And then Paul points to the reason. He says this ought to be done because God has said that none of your labor will be wasted knowing that your labor is not in vain in the Lord. God will use your efforts to serve him, your labors to bring about his purposes. No matter how small, no matter how apparently insignificant, no matter how imperfect they may be, when you serve him, your labor is not lost. He, by his mighty power, uses our weak and imperfect efforts to accomplish his glorious purposes of salvation and glorification for the world. Death has really been swallowed up in victory. It can never have the last word for us. Never will it be triumphant. Life is the one, is what is triumphant now. Life has conquered death 
the hopes of Israel are going to be accomplished. The earth will be full of the knowledge of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. The nations will be made the disciples of Jesus. There is no other way this can end up. If death has been swallowed up, if there has been this great of a victory, all of God's purposes of grace and mercy will be fulfilled. True humanity will be restored to fallen man. And we know this because Christ is risen as the first fruits of them that sleep. And death, therefore, has been destroyed once and for all. Amen. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, help us to believe the glorious victory that has been accomplished, that you have accomplished through your Son, by the power of your Spirit. Help us to rejoice in all that has been done for us and grant that we might now live with joy and holy confidence and boldness to stand where you have called us to stand and not in any way to slacken our, our labor for the kingdom, doing everything that we do to your glory. Strengthen us by your spirit to that end. Deliver us from evil and grant us mercy to show forth your praises in these days. Hear our prayers for Jesus' sake. Amen. Amen. And now let us uh, continue our worship by, by giving our tithes and our offerings. <laughs>
Let us pray. Our most gracious God and heavenly Father, by whose hand all loving things were made, and by whose blessing they are nourished and sustained, we give thee hearty thanks for all thy blessings that have enriched our lives. Enjoying thy gifts and contentment, may, be, may we be enabled by thy grace to use them to thy praise, especially this Resurrection Sunday. We thank thee for thy great love in sending thy Son to be the Savior of the world and in calling us into fellowship with him. And we beseech thee to grant us always thy Holy Spirit, through whom we may grow continually in thankfulness towards thee and also into the likeness of thy Son, Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. Let us stand for prayer. Almighty God, you have given us this good land for our heritage, and we ask that we may always prove ourselves a people mindful of your f favor and glad to do your will. Bless our land with honorable industry, sound learning, and pure manners. Save us from violence, discord, and confusion, from pride and arrogancy, and from every evil way. Defend our liberties and fashion into one united people the multitudes brought here out of many kindreds and tongues. Endue with the spirit of wisdom those to whom in your name we entrust the authority of government, that there may be justice and peace at home, and that through obedience to your law we may show forth your praise among the nations of the earth. And this morning we ask your blessings upon our senators, Bill Cassidy and John Kennedy. Grant them wisdom to support right the righteousness and deliver them from evil. Lord, in your mercy. Hear our Almighty God, our Heavenly Father, guide the nations of the world into the ways of justice and truth and establish among them that peace, which is the fruit of righteousness, that they may become the kingdom of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. We ask again that you would bless the ministries of mercy in our city, life choices, family promise, Christian community ministries, the Renewal Center, Habitat for Humanity, mercy multiplied. Supply their needs. Enable them to serve you with joy and gladness and grant much fruit to their work. Lord, in your mercy. Hear our Almighty God who embraces children with the arms of your mercy and makes them living members of your church, give them grace to stand fast in the faith, to obey your word and to abide in your love. 
that being made strong by your Holy Spirit, they may be enabled to resist temptation, overcome evil, and rejoice in the life that now is and dwell with you in the life that is to come through the merits of Jesus our Savior, who with you, Father, and the Holy Spirit lives and reigns one God, world without end. You are the God who sets the solitary in families, and so we ask that you would grant faithful husbands and wives to those who are unmarried, that they might have their own families to glorify you, and be pleased to continue to protect our pregnant mothers and their babies, Emily Hillicky, Shannon Moreau, Ann Wolf, Savannah Riley, Abby McCarty, Abby, uh, Amy Higginbotham, Priscilla Wilkins, Emily Gotro, Samantha Parker, and Megan Brody. And we ask that you hear the prayers of all those who desire to have children and grant them their desire. Lord, in your mercy. Hear our O Lord, look down from heaven, behold, and visit and relieve your servants who suffer. Look upon them with your mercy. Give them comfort and the sure confidence that they ought to have in you. Defend them in all danger and keep them in perpetual peace and safety through Jesus Christ, our Lord. And again, we lift before you in particular uh, Barbara Pryor, Lori Moreau, Laura Mulhern, Kay Trisler, Ken Trisler, Annabeth Hastie, Ed Medlin, Catherine Spann, Al and Gina Benson, Jim Jordan, Gary White, Billy Amos, Emma Medlin, Lucille White, Debbie Rocket, Solomon and Sebastian Ritchie, Troy and Sandy Lisenby, Ethan Landry, Russell Lang, Beverly Atwood, Jamie Seacosh, Holly Amos, Levi Amos, Natalia Volkoff, Anna Saunders, Lauren Trotter, Beth Kamak, Sarah Winking, Samantha Ritchie, Bob Lewis, Brenda Turner, and Carolyn Hall. Lord, in your mercy. For all these things and whatever else you see that we need, grant us, O Father, for the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, who taught us to pray. Now let us confess our faith. Christian, in whom do you tro trust? We believe in one God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and of all things visible and invisible, and in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only begotten Son of God, begotten of the Father before all worlds, God of God, light of light, very God of very God, begotten, not made, being of one substance with the Father, by whom all things were made who for us men and for our salvation came down from heaven and was incarnate by the Holy Ghost of the Virgin Mary and was made man and was crucified also for us under Pontius Pilate. He suffered and was buried. And the third day he rose again according to the scriptures and ascended into heaven and sits on the right hand of the Father. And he shall come again with glory to judge both the quick and the dead whose kingdom shall have no end. And we believe in the Holy Ghost, the Lord and giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who with the Father and the Son together is worshiped and glorified, who is spoke by the prophets and in one holy Catholic and apostolic church. We acknowledge one baptism for the remission of sins, and we look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. Now hear the word of the Lord from Hebrews chapter 2, beginning at verse 10. 
For it was fitting for him for whom are all things and by whom are all things in bringing many sons to glory to make the author of their salvation perfect through sufferings. For both he who sanctifies and those who are being sanctified are all of one. For which reason he is not ashamed to call them brethren, saying, I will declare your name to my brethren in the midst of the congregation. I will sing praise to you. And again, I will put my trust in him. And again, here am I and the children whom God hath given me. Inasmuch then as the children have partaken of flesh and blood, he himself likewise shared in the same, that through death he might destroy him who had the power of death, that is the devil, and release those who through fear of death were all their lifetime subject to bondage. That is the word of the Lord. Thank you, God. Well, here we see again that death is the particularly favorite instrument of Satan to keep the whole world in fear and and intimidate everyone and make everyone timid and make them be afraid of something they have no reason to be afraid of, which is death. Now, to say that doesn't mean that we all want to die, that if you're really a faithful Christian, you can't, look, you can't wait to die. That's not the point. That would be a disobedient attitude, in fact, because we're to live. We've been called to live. And, uh, and death is an enemy that we, we don't like. We hate it. And there's a, there's a sense in which we should never want to die because you've been created to live. At, you're created after God's image. You've been created to live, not to die. But the fact is that we're not terrorized by death like the world. The world can't stand the thought of that because all they have is this life. They have no comfort, no confidence in the future, no confidence in anything after death, and they shouldn't because they don't, they don't have any reason to be confident when they die. They die under condemnation. And so they have no grounds to be comforted in the face of death by the thought of death or the threat of death. And therefore, they seek every way possible to keep those threats of death away from them. But of course you can't, and Satan loves it that you can't, because he wants you to be paralyzed by the threat of something going wrong that you can't control. And so he has men act like they're gods. They think they can stop and cure the world of all dangerous diseases. They think they can prevent things from actually happening. You can, you can, if you do this, you won't be infected. All of those are vain hopes. We want to live wisely but we don't want to live under the terror of death. That is satanic. And that's where Paul here says, no, you know what Jesus did? He came to destroy. He came to destroy the devil, he who has the power of death, in the sense that he is the one who tempts to sin, and sin brings death. That is his great instrument of rule. And so he says, this is what Jesus has done by his death, And by his resurrection, he swallowed it up so that now we are free from the fear of death. We cannot be held captive by that threat anymore. We are free to die when the time comes. And when you understand that, when you begin to realize that is absolute truth, to be free from the fear of death is an amazing liberty. You don't have to worry anymore about what men say or do or think. So Jesus says, don't worry about other men. Don't fear men. All they can do is kill you. And that's such a weak thing when it gets down to it. If that's all they can do, then they are not the ones you should ever fear. Rather, fear God. Fear the one who is able to destroy both body and soul in hell. Really make death a terrible thing. But when you belong to him, then you have no worries about that either. So we're to live with joy. And this every week we have, we have this table set before us to remind us of the one who defeated death in our behalf, Jesus himself, so that you don't have to fear what is going to happen today, tomorrow, next week, next year, throughout the rest of your life. On the day of life, on the day of death, we're victorious. And this is the, why we eat in celebration of the death of Jesus Because we know in his death, he swallowed up death for us all. And now we're free to live. So I call you, you who have been baptized into the one who died and rose again, you who partake of that resurrection, now come and eat and drink and be merry. 
Because no matter what happens today or this week, God is the one who gives us the victory through his son who swallowed up death. Let's give thanks. Our Father, we thank you that you are the one who created heaven and earth. You are the king. And you have set your son at your right hand. And you have provided from your throne bread to strengthen our hearts. And so blessed are you, almighty God, Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, for you have given us the true bread from heaven, even our King Jesus, our Savior, to be life for us. Help us now as we eat this bread by your Spirit to be made into a loaf that will feed the world around us in this week so that we can show forth your praises, the praises of life and life abundant, life eternal. Receive our thanks. Bless us now as we eat together for Jesus' sake. Amen. Amen. Our Savior, on that night in which he was betrayed, took bread, and when he had given thanks as we have done in his name, he broke it and passed it to his disciples and said, All of you, eat this. This bread is my body which is given for you. Do this in memorial of me.
And now again, let us give thanks to God. Blessed are you, Almighty God, Creator and King of heaven and earth, for you made wine to gladden the heart of man. And blessed are you, Almighty God, Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, for you have given us this true wine, the blood of your Son, for our joy and nourishment. Lord, we give you thanks that we can rejoice in all days, no matter what happens, because of what Jesus has accomplished in our behalf. Thank you for his great victory. Now receive our praise and strengthen us by your joy so that we might live before the world in the same way. Hear our prayers for Jesus' sake. Amen. Amen. Savior, after supper, took the cup, and when he had given thanks again, as we have done in his name, he passed it to his disciples and said, All of you, drink this. This cup is the cup of the new covenant in my blood, which is shed for many for the remission of sins. Peace the Lord be with you.
the body and blood of our Lord, strengthen and preserve you steadfast in the true faith and the life everlasting. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. receive the benediction of the living God. The Lord bless you and guard you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen.